You are listening to another No Fair Remembering Stuff, the Tuesday edition of the Professional Left Podcast, and available wherever you get your podcasts and at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a Patreon button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at the Professional Left Podcast, P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. And it's not safe for work. Not Safe for Work is a blogger tradition. Hey, in our last episode, we left off with a quote from Digby from 20 years ago, calling out Peggy Noonan for her blatant hypocrisy. We also noted that 20 years later, Noonan has only gotten worse, still has her job for life at the Wall Street Journal, and is still treated with reverence by her equally awful peers. And uh, Digby is still blogging. Yes, she is. Uh but getting back to awful people, um, <laughs> pretty much all the Bush era malefactors and enablers in the media who should never have survived the collapse of the Bush administration are still employed and still being credited as the very serious opinion havers all these years later. And that is a problem. Yeah, you can see them every day on MSNBC if you really want to. <laughs> uh, but we're talking about the past and since the rise of the Rush Limbaugh-style conservative media in the late 80s and the early 90s, and the corresponding rise of Gingrich-style politics during that same period, conservatives have, re have relied on a kind of a pincer movement to gain and hold power. The Limbaugh right works the political sewers and keeps the party base in a constant paranoid rage over the imaginary crimes of the dirty commie left like us. And every two years, those votes are harvested by professional Republican mercenaries like Lee Atwater and Karl Rove and Matthew Dowd, now of MSNBC, and Rick Wilson, now of MSNBC. Meanwhile, the job of the respectable right, and those are hacks like Peggy Noonan, who were a constant presence on the Sunday shows, or on MSNBC, or in the New York Times, and the Washington Post, and the Weekly Standard crowd, people like David Brooks and Bill Kristol. Their job was to convince the people who watched the Sunday shows or read the New York Times that the Limbaugh right either didn't really exist at all or was just a rowdy, irrelevant fringe that the respectable people could safely ignore. The respectable right and their fellow travelers in the mainstream media like David Broder, remember him? Oh, God, yes. Their job also was to relentlessly tone police Democrats. Anyone on the left who got out of line would be buried under an avalanche of scolding about the importance of civility and temperate language. And in 2003 and 2004, in particular, we bloggers said fuck a lot. We just did. We did. We did. <laughs> it became a trademark. In fact, at the it bottom did. of this podcast, there'll be a quiz of all the old school blogger reference we've made that are hidden like Easter eggs throughout this podcast. <laughs> They're Easter eggs. <laughs> well, you know... Um, one one blog called Currenti Wire said that the word fuck was our guarantee to you. Yes. That this is not government propaganda. Absolutely. Because right? we will never be on any broadcast network or any newspaper. Right. So that's... we're going to use the F word to, to prove to you, to mm -hmm. denote that we are outsider media. Yeah. That was, that's what that was about. Mm -hmm. Um But in 2003, 2004, the most uncivil and intemperate treasonous thing one could do according to the respectable right mm -hmm. was to protest the war and criticize george w bush you just yep. horrors all the pearl clutching over that mm -hmm. on february 15th 2003 tens of millions of people in countries all over the world took to the streets to oppose george bush's plans to invade iraq and i took middle child who was just a few months old in an umbrella stroller Yep. to downtown Birmingham, Alabama, to protest the war. There weren't as many people there as there were other places, but we had a presence. At the time, it was uh, worldwide the largest mass protest in history. You know, after that, the Women's March eclipsed it. But mm -hmm. at that time, it was the largest one. And it was virtually ignored by a mainstream media that was terrified of getting crosswise with the Bush administration. 
and looked forward to the ratings overflow that would come from the invasion. It was a socially accepted and enforced standard that once a president has decided to take the country to war, it was the job of every citizen to shut up and get with the program. Everyone knew that politics ends at the water's edge, unquote. Mm -hmm. Everyone understood that to disagree with the president in time of war was to denigrate the troops. And that that sentiment was everywhere, everywhere. Mm -hmm. If you talk bad about the war, I mean, this is why the Dixie Chicks had their careers destroyed. Um, if you talk, if you say mean words about George Bush or think the war was a mistake, everyone knows you never do that when the president has put troops on the ground in a foreign country ever, except some of us couldn't help but notice that the people who were shouting the loudest about how traitorous it was to criticize Bush and his Iraq war were exactly the same people who were shouting the loudest about how incompetent and dangerous Bill Clinton had been when he put U.S. troops into Bosnia. And we came up with a short sampler platter for you to enjoy. This is Senator George Voinovich, Republican of Ohio, quote, we should not give the president blanket authority to get us into another Vietnam. Tom DeLay, quote, you can support the troops, but not the president. Then comes a guy named Rick Santorum. The president is once again releasing American military might on a foreign country with an ill-defined objective and no exit strategy. He has yet to tell Congress how much this operation will cost, and he has not informed our nation's armed forces about how long they will be away from home. These strikes do not make for a sound foreign policy. That's Rick Santorum. Um, Karen Hughes who was speaking on the behalf of Governor George W. Bush, said, quote, if we're going to commit American troops, we must be certain they have a clear mission, an achievable goal, and an exit strategy. A guy named Joe Scarborough, who was at the time a, an awful right-wing conservative Republican congressperson from Florida, said, quote, well, I just think it's a bad idea. What's going to happen is they're going to be over there for 10, 15, maybe 20 years. Then there was this guy named Sean Hannity of Fox News, April 6, 1999. Explain to the mothers and fathers of American servicemen that may come home in body bags why their son or daughter have to give up their life. Then a guy named Governor George W. Bush of Texas himself said, victory means exit strategy. And it's important for the president to explain to us what the exit strategy is. All of the people that said exit strategy should have exit strategy written in their own feces on a plate and be made to eat it. Right. Or tattooed on their forehead. Like, or tattooed you know, on their forehead. The, the end would be of fine, the, too. Inglorious bastards. You know, just so people yeah. know who they are from right. a distance. Exit strategy. Yeah. So uh, these quotes that Drucklass just read to you were circulating at the time on the liberal blogs. But nowhere else, because suddenly, Driftglass, it was unpatriotic to remember such things. Oh. Suddenly, it was no fair remembering stuff. <gasps> what a great name for a possible podcast. We should it do a is. podcast. Like that, we should try that. <laughs> um, now, the source of these quotes is actually sort of the history of the liberal blogosphere in a nutshell. Back in 2009, I pulled them all from a site called the Poor Man Institute for a long post I wrote entitled Like a Virgin. And the subject of that post was how many times Republicans and the mainstream media had colluded to memory hole things they'd once said and done that had suddenly become an embarrassing inconvenience to the new party line. Well, guess what? Rick Santorum is still around. He's run for president a couple times since then, and I believe he now has a contract with CNN. George Bush remains free and unindicted for war crimes. And Joe Scarborough has his own show on MSNBC and has had such a show for 20 effing years. And he has four hours now. He does. But like hundreds of other liberal blogs, the original Poor Man Institute blog vanished years ago. Its archives, including the links to all of those quotes by prominent Republicans, has disappeared. The writers briefly reappeared on a different platform in 2008 and finally shuttered the place for good sometime in 2010. As you know, Blue Gal, every so often I do Mike's blog roundup for Crooks and Liars. What a great blog. Uh, for a couple of weeks at a time. I'm doing them this week, as a matter of fact. Mike's blog roundup, which was named after the late Mike Finnegan, 
has been a feature of Crooks and Liars since the beginning and is one of the very few liberal blogosphere institutions that still reflect the original blogger ethos of looking up and linking down. Back when the goal was to grow a mutually supportive blogger community because, well, we had to. Because by then it was clear that we had no allies, that no one was going to come and save us. That we had to build a brand new liberal media from scratch by ourselves. And that began by seeking out those smaller blogs by good writers that weren't getting any attention and throwing a spotlight on them. It was great. It was a wonderful time to be a blogger. But doing Mike's blog roundup now uh, actually gets me kind of depressed sometimes. Because when I go around looking for fresh posts from lesser known blogs using the most comprehensive blog roles I know of, I find that maybe 80% of them are now all gone. They're just HTML links to nowhere or to domain names that have been bought by like Herbalife or some weird dating service. And all those millions of words that people passionately committed to digital paper and published for the world to see during the one of the most consequential periods in modern American history have now just vanished. Now, that's not unexpected. You no. know the quote from the last scene in Patton, all glory is fleeting. We, I do we know, know that. that. Mm -hmm. uh, that'll always be true. And the liberal blogosphere is still here, uh, but so much has changed and so much has been forgotten. For example, we talked in the last episode about the first big flex of the progressive net roots being the Howard Dean campaign of 2004. Well, a lot of people forget that the second big flex of net roots muscle came one year later in Ned Lamont's campaign to unseat Joe Lieberman in 2005. Joe Lieberman was the GOP's favorite Democrat. Mm -hmm. uh, he was sort of the Kristen Cinema, perhaps, of his time. Or Joe Manchin, if you will. Yes. He was Al Gore's vice presidential pick in 2000, who did more than anyone outside of the Republican Supreme Court to undermine Gore's legitimate recount requests. In 2008, Lieberman would be given the stage at the Republican National Convention to endorse John McCain, where he would praise Sarah Palin as a dedicated reformer. I remember and, that. And denigrate Barack Obama as an inexperienced, unpatriotic, captive of the far left. I yep. think he means black man. Uppity black man. I think that's I think really that's what he means. What he means. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in 2009, Lieberman would almost single-handedly kill the public option in Obama's Affordable Care Act. Which we did talk about during our ACA No Fair Remembering Stuff episodes. Go back and right. check them out. They're wonderful. Um, but in 2005, this is the year we're talking about, Lieberman was the most rapidly and publicly pro-war Democratic member of the U.S. Senate. And he was up for re-election. In the campaign to beat Joe Lieberman, who was a powerful three-term incumbent who'd been the Democratic Party's candidate for vice president just five years earlier, would end up changing politics forever. And it was between these two really remarkable events, the Dean campaign of 2004 and the Lieberman, um, I'm sorry, the Lamont campaign of 2005, that Blue Gal and I started blogging. So we're going to put a pin in the Lamont campaign for just a minute and talk about the moment when the net roots really crashed the gates. Well, we're going to talk about our own starting of the blogging. Yeah. That's, well, that was that was a whole bunch of blogs took off during that yeah, time. Yeah, right. Years it, mine. it wasn't just us. It was yep. this is when everybody signed up to be a blogger. Yep. Um, and I found out about blogging from looking at the internet and reading stuff and et cetera. Uh, I don't remember the first blog I read, but Crooks and Liars was definitely on the list. I originally started blogging because I wanted a disciplined way to keep writing every day. At that point, I had three very young children, one special needs boy, and two girls under two. And I had a difficult husband at the time. My husband now is very easy, but at the time, it was a more difficult husband. Oh. So blogging oh. was an escape. <laughs> two different husbands, I should say. Yeah, let, let's make it real clear, shall we? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this was first husband. He was difficult. Uh, blogging was an escape and a way to remain connected to the intellectual part of my brain that otherwise was consumed with diapers and speech therapy and making sure the shampoo bottles in the bathroom were lined up just right because I had a difficult husband. Did I tell you that? Yes, I did. Uh, I didn't even consider that I would become a political blogger. 
But I lived in Alabama at the time. And so Blue Gal in a Red State was a most uninspired branding. I don't think I would have used Blue Gal had I known that I would be still doing this 18 years later. But at the time, I just put it up there to have a name and that was it. Uh, I quickly found that I could link to other bloggers and what they were writing. And that was really exciting and really important to me. Uh, and then I got linked by Mike Finnegan at Mike's Blog Roundup at Crooks and Liars in September of 2005. That was my first link to Mike's Blog Roundup. Ooh. I got 976 hits that day. Whoa. Yeah, huge. That felt like a billion. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I thought it was an absolute miracle. Oh, my gosh. I can't believe this. Uh, and the thing is, I still think that today. I think... Every single person who reads what I write or hears what I say into a donated microphone on a used laptop is a miracle. It's just yep. amazing yep. to me. Yep. Uh, I also discovered at the time and back in 2005 that there are and were a lot of horny trolls on the Internet. Go figure. Mm -hmm. And I'm a gal who drinks with the boys, always have, not, you know, I don't have any problem with off-color humor or swearing no. or anything like that. So uh, I wrote a blog post with a joke about panties and found that my traffic went up because there were clearly people <laughs> there searching Google for panties. SEO, baby. But that started a huge thing on my blog for a number of years. Every post, I would put up a disembodied photo or image of a pair of panties. That was usually associated in some way with the post. Um, every post had a picture of panties. <laughs> and it was just this running joke. You know, that, that was it. But I was the panties blogger for the longest time. Um, and then I also went through a phase where I wrote as blue gal in the third person. And that really didn't. I, I have to, to talk about that because that didn't work. That was something that really didn't work. And I tried it. And uh, one reviewer told me that feature of my writing made her want to poke her eyes out with a spork. <laughs> so I stopped doing that. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, it's good to experiment. There was, there was no, uh, no downside to experimenting. But uh, back to my personal history. And by 2007, I was regularly sending Mike Finnegan links to other blogs that I thought worthy of that attention. Mike told me that I was the most generous blogger out there because I was always sending him tips from other bloggers. And most bloggers were trying to get Morning Hitwood only for themselves. By the way, Morning Hitwood Drift Glass coined that phrase. You're welcome, America. And in August of 2007, I began writing and editing regularly for Crooks and Liars. And I became a masthead editor in 2015. One funny story I always tell about my first week on the Crooks and Liars masthead John Amato explained to me on hiring day in 2007 that the churning of the political world never stops. It never stops, Fran. You're just going to have to accept it every day, every night. Something's going on. We always have to cover it. It never stops. And I said, well, John, I think I can ease into this job because we are in the middle of the August congressional recess. It's not, you know, everybody's on vacation. It's going to be okay. I'll learn it as I go, but for the first couple of weeks, it's going to be okay. And the very next morning, Carl Rove resigned from the Bush White House. <laughs> and I tried to call John Amato, who's in California, and I was in Alabama on East Coast time. And uh, later on that day, he called me because he called me every day. And, and I said, I was trying to call you. I was trying to call you. <laughs> he said, what, what? said, well, I wanted to know, you to know that Carl Rove resigned. And he said, you tried to call me at 5.30 in the morning to tell me Carl Rove resigned? You should only call me if the site is down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, got it. Got it. Mm -hmm. At that hour, you should only call me if the site is down. So I learned his priorities very uh -huh. quickly. Because yep. Carl yep. Rove's come and go. And someone will post that story. Yeah. Don't worry about and, that. And it, it was covered. I mean, somebody yeah. did. So it was covered. But but I didn't know, you know, whether he wanted to write it or what I should do. You should only call me that hour if the site is down. Uh, the beauty of the blogosphere in those early years, and I know you felt the same way going back and looking at 
18 year old posts oh yeah of, yeah the, the mixture of cringe and oh wow i remember that you know is... oh no all of my posts are solid gold will go all of them <laughs> all of them every single one every everyone every, is just a gold turd flushed every, to history every semicolon every space <laughs> every typo every adorable typo that i deliberately put in there because oh you know, yeah sure all of them are on purpose yeah. oh yeah it's all gold yeah solid I remember I used to send you regular emails mm -hmm. saying typo alert. <laughs> yes. I, I and treasure then I stopped. Those. Yeah. And then we got married. We got married and I just <laughs> stopped. No, no point. Uh, but the, the beauty of the blogosphere in those early years, in my humble and very humble opinion, is we didn't know what we were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it evolved that you and I, Drift Glass, figured out that we had the power to give other people a vocabulary for what they were thinking and feeling in the world of American politics. Mm -hmm. And I think we figured that out very early on in this podcast in 2010. Um, and, and we were early adopters of that technology, very early adopters. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, so at some point we'll talk about the <laughs> podcastosphere. But I'm just so grateful for the ability to share that every single day. And for those of you that help out with a donation or a share or a comment or an email, you guys are the best. The best yeah. part of this experience is you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Uh, and so I've been blogging and podcasting since 2004. Yeah. Jesus. In November of 2022, my blog turned 18. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's my story. And, and my kids are to growing it. up and yeah, off to that's, college. So. That's the thing. The, 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 you can watch just the hash marks on the kitchen door. Yeah. The growth marks is like, this is what, it is astonishing to me that those little tiny people are now mm -hmm. grown up autonomous adults yeah. during the time when you and I have been doing this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and not just because this was our job for what, 18 years or our self-chosen job or avocation, but these have been some of the most consequential decades in American history. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we live through them. And one of the things that we both share is that we have archives. We've got yes. archives. We, if we're in doubt or trying to figure something out or remember, you know, the sequence of events or do like a podcast called no fair remembering stuff. <laughs> we we've got, I've got 12,000 posts out there. Not yeah. kidding. Going back yeah. to the, you know, dawn of the blogosphere. And the thing is I never, ever wanted to write about politics or speak about politics or go on a microphone and talk about politics in my life. I never wanted to do that. I wanted to write, mm -hmm. but I was a programmer and a, technici a technician guy and a public policy guy. I had no interest in doing any of this, but 2004, mm -hmm. 2004, that was my, what the fuck is happening? That's it. I'm done playing nice. I'm done being civilized. I'm done messing around year. Um, for a lot of us, that was the moment when we said, holy shit, the system's not going to fix itself. Something, mm -hmm. something horribly is horribly unfixably wrong and no one is coming to fix it. With our and democracy, something's with wrong democracy. with our democracy. Yeah. We knew and, in, I mean, people are talking about this now. This is 2004. Yeah. 18 years ago. And something's not just broken with our democracy, but all the pillars that are supposed to protect us. The media is broken and the Republican Party is broken and the Democratic response to the Republican Party is broken. All of these things are are supposed to work and none of them are working. Mm -hmm. And oh crap, there's no grown-ups. <laughs> we we've got to do this. So that was the year that a friend of mine at work turned me on to a site called Talking Points Memo, um, which in turn led me to a place called Daily Coast. And the news blog and Steve Gilliard and me being a commenter there and so forth. But there was no YouTube. There was no Twitter. Nothing like that. Uh, there was Wi-Fi here and there. But those were still the days of something called war driving, which some of you might remember, which is rolling through town in a car looking for Wi-Fi networks to use with your laptop or your smartphone. And that name comes from war dialing, which you might know from war games. Uh, which consisted of dialing every phone number in a specific way in search of modems. Remember yeah, and you sound? said smartphone. They really weren't smartphones. They no. were flip phones. They were flip phones, but yeah. But you could check the bars on them to see if there was a Wi-Fi in the area. Yeah. Well, and this was also the time of the antennas, car and or can-based antennas, when clever young people figured out that you could 
significantly boost your Wi-Fi signal by using an empty Pringles can. It was a, you know, we used to build stuff in this country. Blue gal. <laughs> we used to invent things. Cans. Yeah. And I did some of that too. Um, I had pretty good high speed internet access at home, but I was working these insane hours in those days. And I usually get home late and be just exhausted. Um, so the question was, how do you stay current with the liberal blogosphere and stay up to date on the news and blog every day within those parameters? Because blogging every day was the ethos of the blogs. That's the thing I inherited. And I try to live that that ethos to this day mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and do all those things while not getting fired. Because the entire time I was working for the city of Chicago and blogging at the same time, I was never more than a phone call to HR away from being fired. And believe me, there were enough people in my department who would have been delighted to make that call. And I was high enough in senior management in the city that my firing would have made for a really spicy uh, two-page story in the Sun-Times the next day. Or Mm -hmm. not two-page, but two-day story. I I would have been on the paper. I would have been famous. Now, it never occurred to me to stop, but it it was very clear to me I would have to be extremely careful about crossing those streams, about doing anything at work that led to um, me being discovered as a blogger um, or vice versa, really, because word gets around and word gets back. So using my real name was obviously out of the question. So I just kept using this drift glass handle that I had invented to be a commenter at the news blog, and that just stuck with me. Like you... If I had to do it all over again, I'd choose something different. But I thought, well, drift glass is essentially um, industrial waste glass that's been pounded by the surf into something beautiful. I thought, well, that's kind of cute. I'll do that. Also, Sam Delaney has a story called Drift Glass, which I kind of liked. So, hey, that's what I'll do. And, and your wife has a piece of drift glass on the ring on her finger. A yes, she does. A piece of blue drift glass yes, is she my does. engagement ring. So yeah. um, that's who I am from, from now on. Uh, And while my city department did have high-speed internet access and eventually reliable Wi-Fi, posting anything that might have had a digital footprint from that location could sooner or later be traced back to me. Uh, In my mind, the end would come like Kevin Costner in No Way Out, me racing (laughs) through the halls of the city of Chicago being chased, (laughs) except instead of Costner, it's me, a blogger, and there's a couple of assholes from IT and HR and the department's political officer, because in every Chicago department, there really is at least one political officer. Um, and that would be done with the eager assistance of the handful of my coworkers who really, really wanted to see me and my big liberal mouth gone. Um, we had a department intranet site, which my team built and maintained, and we had a quote of the day thing going there. And I updated that every evening before going home. And one night, I posted a quote by, I think it was George Orwell, or maybe Mark Twain, or maybe John Swift, on the follies of war. Uh, And the next day, a couple of Bush fanboys who worked in my department showed up in my office and demanded I take it down. That's how ultra-sensitive they were to any heresy, and that's how eager they were to jump up in the face of any liberal saying anything bad about George Bush. These were the kind of goofs who would definitely have gotten me axed if they had ever gotten a whiff of the fact that I was doing blogging stuff, liberal blogging stuff, criticizing Bush and Cheney and the war and the media during my off hours. Because when you worked on that kind of job, there are no off hours. So browsing the internet from work was no big deal. I could read the Times or the Post or even Talking Points Memo or the news blog for subject matter just to keep up with what was going on. But posting from work was a non-starter. Plus, and this is the part about making this up as we went along, I had no one to talk to about this. Yeah. I had no one to consult with about what do you do when you're in a high profile, high pressure civilian life that runs from seven in the morning, sometimes until midnight, and you blog anonymously, and how do you do all that, and how do you balance that? So like you, I was just making it up as I went along, and I found Mm -hmm. out later that most bloggers made this stuff up as they went along. Just they tried things, and they didn't work, and they tried other things, and they failed, and eventually we figured stuff out. So I was blogging on the down low and war driving. And you wouldn't know it, but a bunch of the posts I wrote back in the old days were actually composed on my non-departmental issue Palm Pilot. Remember Palm Pilots? I love my little Palm Pilot. It was a very handy little thing. It could detect Wi-Fi and was small enough to use when I was walking around or driving around, scouting out likely spots near work where I could do blog and lunch. I also had a little foldable Palm Pilot keyboard, which came with a kickstand for holding up the Palm, And that's how I would compose a post when I had a spare minute 
and how I scouted out all these little spots around town where Wi-Fi was available to me near my office. If you saw me in a bar at one in the morning in the corner, sipping scotch, maybe talking politics with one of my friends, you probably saw that I had a little Palm Pilot <laughs> propped up on the, on the bar and I was typing away and I was typing some post I was doing for the next day. Um, and to pay the bills, I was also teaching a couple of classes at Columbia College. And that gave me some internet access, but not a lot of free time to blog. Now, I was on a pretty tight post-divorce budget in those days and did not have cable television. Uh, in fact, this will shock you. I didn't have cable until I moved to Springfield with my beautiful wife in 2011. Uh, also, I had no digital subscriptions to the major newspapers. I did have a large DVD collection. So if you ever want to see a whole bunch of Tashira Mufuni movies, I've got them all. <laughs> I think um, they're still under the bed, actually. I, oh, they're around here somewhere. Uh, they <laughs> tend to migrate to the machine and back. Uh, but during all those years, I lived in Chicago. I made do with broadcast television, these Sunday shows and those sorts of things, and availed myself of the DTV Converter Box Coupon Program when free TV went digital in 2009. Now, show of hands, does anyone else remember the Converter Box Coupon Program? And that's how it was for me. From the first day I started blogging until way after I was laid off by the city during the Great Recession. I was reading, keeping track of the blogging world, outlining what I would write during the few free moments I had during the day, and then catching up with bits of cable news at night, and then writing well into the wee hours of the morning sometimes. And then you get up, and you do it all over again the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And 18 years later, I'm still a blogger. But let's get back to Ned Lamont, Drift Glass. Enough about oh, yeah, that's you. Right. Let, let, that's, yeah, Ned Lamont. I, I left Ned <laughs> hanging there, didn't I? Sorry about Sorry, Ned. 2005, Ned Lamont. I got to tell you, Drift Glass and everybody, spoiler, Ned Lamont lost the 2006 Senate race in Connecticut, which no! was a huge disappointment. You ruined I it. I think he turned out okay. Yeah. He's governor of Connecticut now, so yeah. He's, I think he turned okay. out okay. Uh but the way the campaign was conducted, the allies who flocked to his cause, and the way the campaign used the new medium of blogging changed history. It's a little like the Scopes Monkey Trial 80 years earlier, which pitted a powerful national political figure, William Jennings Bryant. And we are not comparing Joe Lieberman to William Jennings no, Bryant. No, we're not. Just the, the, it's the, just the, the formula is similar. The, the, the um, amount of national stature they had the, amount, they had, the name exactly. recognition yeah William the Jennings Brent against an underdog high school teacher named john scopes you know who yeah. today who in 2004 would have been a blogger right uh and it was reported out to the nation using the new medium of radio uh-huh scopes lost the trial but he won the cause in the court of public opinion because mm -hmm. of this new technology bryant won the court case, but his reputation was destroyed. And that is exactly what happened with the Lamont Lieberman campaign. Mm -hmm. Now, the dump Lieberman campaign began with the infamous Bush Lieberman kiss. Yeah. And if you don't remember what the Bush Lieberman kiss was, well, that's what we're here for. Uh, it was 2005. Bush gave his State of the Union address and he's walking out shaking hands with lawmakers. And as he left the chamber, Bush abruptly grabbed Lieberman's head in both hands and kissed him on the cheek. And they called it the birth of the blues. <laughs> <laughs> well, they called it something. Certainly yeah, there sure were did. a lot of outraged Democrats mm -hmm. who did not appreciate Joe no. Lieberman getting kissed by George Bush when that guy is supposed to be a goddamn Democrat. That's when a retired middle-aged Connecticut truck driver named Keith Crane started a site called dumpjoe.com. Crane knew nothing about computers before he started, but quickly found the Netroots community of bloggers to be an inexhaustible source of technical help and encouragement. He said at the time, you get a better education on the blogs than you do in college. Yeah, yeah I, I watched him on a documentary and he said, look, I thought to refresh my screen so I could see if my blog had updated, you had to unplug my, my computer and plug it back in again. Yeah, yeah. And he reached out to the blogging community and said, no, there's an F5 key for that and there's other ways to do that. And he was just blown away by all that help he got and all the encouragement Everyone he got. Everyone was very generous back in yeah. those days on the Absolutely. internet. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Common cause, there was a common yeah. cause. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, the Lamont campaign showed what was special about the liberal blogosphere in the early days and what a threat it posed to the establishment. Because thanks to the collaborative spirit of thousands of people suddenly discovering each other through this medium, helping each other, debating ideas, linking to each other, strategizing, and fundraising. Yeah. Ned Lamont actually won the Connecticut senatorial primary in 2006. He beat an incumbent senator in his mm -hmm. own party in the primary. Yep. Earth-shaking. Yep. Now, uh, Lamont lost in the general election, as we said, because Lieberman's pals quickly set up a very well-funded independent third party, <laughs> Connecticut for Lieberman. <laughs> and yeah. they rallied around him and gave him lots of institutional support. Yeah, I, I thought independent third parties were supposed to be, you know, disrupting the status quo bill, Cal. <laughs> it was going to save us from, from all the bad things that the institutional parties uh, did to, yeah. to and, I and guess I not. you were supposed to respect the uh, decision of your party's voters in your state. Uh, well, Joe Lieberman just wanted to disrupt the corrupt duopoly, Blue no, Cow. He didn't. You know, no, he was the fucking corrupt duopoly. <laughs> yes, he was. Uh, but he raised a ton of money from special interests, and in the end, uh, while Ned Lamont did win sixty-seven percent of the Democratic vote, um, thirty-three percent of Democrats and fifty-four percent of "quote unquote" independents, and seventy percent of Republicans. I'm an independent. For yeah, those people. Well, yeah. Those all those people voted for Holy Joe Lieberman, which was enough for him to win. However, the mere fact that somebody had the gall to challenge Joe Lieberman in the primary and win infuriated the mainstream media. And no one pooped their pants harder than the dean of the Washington, D.C. press corps, David Broder. And now is when you have to learn a phrase from the old days. And that phrase is high broderism. And we turn to our friend Boo Man from the OG blog Boo Man Tribune to explain what is high broderism and why does it hate left-wing bloggers? High broderism is a school of thought best exemplified by Washington Post reporter David Broder that Washington, D.C. elites should provide the common wisdom to the ragged masses beyond the Beltway. Moreover, High Broderism believes that the only acceptable politics is centrist. See if any of this sounds familiar. It's not so much where the center is at any given time, it's the centrism itself. Therefore, politicians that occasionally buck their own party, like Joe Lieberman and John McCain, reside on the Mount Olympus of High Broderism. In this view, it is more virtuous of Lieberman to buck the winds of his party and support the president on Iraq then it is odious for him to be wrong on the issue. And this is how David Broder put it in a September 21st, 2006 editorial in the Washington Post. Quote, Now, however, you can see the Independence Party forming on both sides of the aisle. They are mobilizing to resist not only Bush, but also the extremist elements in American society. The vituperative, foul-mouthed bloggers on the left and the doctrinaire religious extremists on the right who would convert their faith into a whipping post for their opponent. The center is beginning to fight back. Michael Bloomberg, the Republican mayor of New York, is holding a fundraiser for Senator Joe Lieberman, a Democrat running as an independent against the blogger's favorite, Ned Lamont. And let me just tell you, the phrase vituperative foul-mouthed bloggers on the left has been worn as a badge of honor by liberal bloggers ever since. I had a coffee cup made up with that phrase on it. Yes, and it's still around here somewhere. And it I, is. Vituperative foul mouth blogger of the left was our thing. It Absolutely. was. I still, I still drink from it to remind me. Yeah, we're still those that's people. On, that's on my blog header, which I haven't changed in 15 years. In many years. Yeah. Many, many years. Meanwhile, at the other pillar of establishment journalism, the New York <laughs> Times' own David Broder mini-me, David Brooks, was also freaking out and throwing an identical tantrum over the identical event, Lamont beating Lieberman in a free and fair Democratic primary. Go figure. Yeah. Oh, no, he flipped out. And, yep. you know, I've written a few things about David Brooks. Uh, just this a is few. One of, uh, but this, this is, is my turn. My turn to talk oh, about David uh, Brooks. I apologize. Let me step out of your way, Blue Gal. <laughs> so he decides to write another op-ed about a third party, Driftglass. Oh, yeah. 
because there and and you have quoted this a time or two on this podcast. I have. There are this is August 10th, 2006. There are two major parties on the ballot, but there are three major parties in America. No, actually there are three parties on the ballot in Connecticut. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, there is the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, and the McCain-Lieberman Party. Mm-hmm. The McCain-Lieberman Party begins with a rejection, I can't get over that he said this, of the Sunni Shiite style of politics itself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he goes on and on and on. And here's the money shot. The flamers in the established parties tell themselves that their enemies are so vicious they have to be vicious too. They rationalize their behavior by insisting that the circumstances have forced them to shelve their integrity for the good of the country. They imagine that once they have achieved victory through pulverizing rhetoric, they will return to the moderate and nuanced sensibilities they think they still possess. But the experience of Tom DeLay and the net root delays in the Democratic Party, as if. Uh, amply demonstrates that means determine ends. Hyperpartisans may have started with subtle beliefs, but their beliefs led them to partisanship, and their partisanship led to malice, and malice made them extremist, and pretty soon they were no longer the same people, unquote. And I, I got to say, I think if this primary situation where a Democrat beat a, an establishment Democrat in a primary Mm-hmm. had not been in the greater New York City, Washington, D.C. beltway of Connecticut. Yeah. Where people have, you know, s- spring break homes and summer homes and travel and so forth for their vacations. If this hadn't been so close to home for them, I don't think it would have been the same big deal. No. Even it's if it had been California, I don't it's think it would have been the same big deal that it was that Joe Lieberman lost. Yeah, uh, Sally Quinn described and as yeah. was mocked yeah. thoroughly as the village. Yep. This is yep. the village where, you know, and they came here and they ruined our little village here where we run things. And they, and they were, she was talking about the Clintons, but the mentality yeah. is the same. I yeah. also love Brooks's construction, his Yoda like construction. You know, fear leads to anger, anger leads to hatred, hatred leads to Ned Lamont. So, <laughs> you know, yeah, okay, that's exactly what happened. Uh, but, so but funny. what was what was really making Brooks and Broder and the rest of the grandees of the Beltway lose their friggin' minds was the unspoken understanding that the left was always supposed to be a punching bag mm-hmm. and never, ever supposed to hit back. Right. That Gingrich and Limbaugh spouting the worst racist bile was just, you know, the normal background noise of American politics. Nothing to be worried about. Don't pay any attention. And that when George W. Bush got elected by beating up on gays, well, that was just a sound political tactic. It was a smart move. But the left finally getting up off the mat and taking the fight to Republicans, well, that was too goddamn monstrous to bear. And the establishment media was right to be afraid. Because even though Ned Lamont's upstart campaign ultimately came up short in the general election, it showed hundreds of other bloggers around the country and hundreds of other Democratic campaigns what was possible. And when Democrats swept back into power, in the House and in the Senate in 2006, it was thanks in no small part to the organizational, financial, and media support from liberal bloggers. The rise of the Netroots as a political force became the story of the year. In March of 2006, Duncan Black, who blogs as Atria, so I'm sure you all know him, Mm -hmm. uh, was name-dropped on an episode of The West Wing on NBC. We had arrived. Yeah. Uh, I, I... Say that we with a grain of salt, and as we'll much get as, into that later. <laughs> as much as you hate the West Wing, that was certainly an hate acknowledgement. Hate the West Wing, and don't consider Duncan Black a we. He's a nice guy, I'm sure, but <laughs> yeah, uh, much bigger blogger than I am. Mm-hmm. Uh, in 2006, Time Magazine started running features with titles like "Campaigning on the Blogs" and "Bloggers on the Bus" and "Blog Watch." I think this was around the same time uh, that John Stewart talked about Skippy, the bush kangaroo. I think on you're his right. show. Yeah. 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 Um, Nancy Pelosi got crosswise with coast readers when she agreed to post something there, but didn't stick around to engage in the give and take conversations in the comment section mm-hmm. that were the norm mm-hmm. at the time. Absolutely. Yep. 
Time Magazine reported that, quote, one Daily Coast user accused Nancy Pelosi of hit and run diaries, while another griped, Daily Coast is not your personal press release piggy bank, unquote. The next day, she returned to the blog to try to explain herself. I don't have the kind of schedule that allows me to respond to every comment, Pelosi wrote, but I will delegate a staffer on my future post to answer your questions, unquote. That must have gone over real good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll staff it out. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll farm that out to a staffer. Oh. Yeah. Um, but, you know, blogs were being taken seriously. And mm-hmm. in 2007, Yearly Coast held the second annual gathering of the liberal blogging tribes, uh, which 1,500 people attended, including yours truly. I was there. After all, it was held in Chicago, and I felt a certain, you know, uh, civic obligation to show up and show the colors. Every Democratic candidate for president was there, along with the entire Democratic congressional leadership. And hundreds of credentialed members of the media were there from around the world. And the headline in the Washington Post was, quote, Net Roots event becomes Democrats' other national convention. But personally, uh, my favorite moments were spent with a small gathering of Steve Gilliard's fans, fellow Steve Gilliard's fans, because I was a big one. Steve had passed away that June. And it was just wonderful to meet the people I knew so well uh, from the blogging world, but for the first time face to face, to share a drink with them, to share stories with them, to grieve with them. And I still have a little matchbox of actual drift glass that they gave me. And I shake it every now and then. I got to say, I think of all the people who carried Steve Gilliard's mantle forward, you're the top. Yeah, there's. we'll talk maybe in some other uh, venue about the the ambitious group news blog that got started no. it was gonna, oh, and, yeah. <laughs> and it had a whole it had a whole stable of writers and it was a right. big thing and it was going to be the thing and it was going to do a thing and it petered out after about a year or two mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. there's just something about i don't know what it was but i think blogging had seen its day because well let's get back to lamont because with the, yeah. without the lamont campaign showing what the netroots could do those years of 2006 and 2007 would have unfolded very differently and without an active and empowered net roots and an internet savvy campaign team, it's more than likely that Barack Obama would never have become the Democrats nominee in 2008 mm-hmm. or have gone on to win the White House. So in 2007, the possibilities for us bloggers and this new medium really did seem unlimited. It was like, where we can do anything. Look at this new power we have. Look at this community we've built. This is wonderful. But even at the yearly coast convention in Chicago, There were already signs that blogging was about to change in ways that would make people like me, many years later, look back on 2007 as the moment that the net roots crested and then began to recede. But Mm -hmm. about that in our next episode. Well, and and I went back, as you did, to look at the early, early posts that I did for the first Mm -hmm. three or four years. Yep. uh, From 2004 to 2008. And... The amazing thing to me in looking over those posts was the number of times I was chiding my fellow bloggers for paying too much attention to Stat Counter. Right. That's right. And that and and I quoted Steve Gilliard in my post about, you know, do the writing, do the work, write every day. Mm-hmm. Uh, be an impassioned activist with your writing and with your blogging and make sure you connect to other people, find out what's going on, report on it write about it, write your feelings about it, et cetera. And don't pay attention to how much traffic you have because the important point is to be the coal that turns into a diamond. Right. Not right. to be mm-hmm. some flash that gets lots of attention. That's not what we're here for. And uh, those people that believed that the way Steve Gilliard did are still here. Yes, we are. We are. And and the ones who were like, well, if I can't get linked at Mike's blog Roundup every 10 days and get that hit count up, it's not worth it. And that's not the point. That's not what it's about. And it's still not about that. We're right. not trying to get Keith Olbermann numbers at our podcast. Believe no. me, we're not. Just half that. Just have about half that. <laughs> would be yeah, fine. We, we'd yeah. like to have... We have about a tenth of that, actually. But, well, well, look. You know, you know we have six million downloads since 2011. So that's true. That's, that's, that's a lot of downloads. I mean, yeah. I I know that number. I do yeah. know. I am aware of it, but I don't obsess over it. 
Oh, I, I sit up every night and just watch the stat kind of take no, over one more, you one more. You sit up every night watching Barney Miller. I do. I take great comfort in watching Barney Miller every now and then. It, it brings me joy. Yes. Um, but yeah, the, the whole idea was to do this thing. And and like the dinosaurs, um, they didn't all disappear. They evolved. They changed. Yeah. Yeah. And bloggers evolved into other things. A lot. I mean, we'll talk about this on the next episode, but a lot of them just dropped out because it, it's goddamn exhausting. Yeah. It takes an yeah. enormous amount of commitment and effort and time. And it, which, it doesn't pay. I mean, it no, doesn't pay no, what you can no, make no. in a full-time job ever. No, I'm, yeah. And I, you know, when I was going to school at Columbia college and talking to people about a writing career and I was about 10 years older than everybody else. So I was about as old as some of my professors, everybody was running the other way. Um, mm-hmm, everybody mm-hmm. was flocking to Leo Burnett to get jobs there because nobody could make a living writing. Um, mm-hmm. You can make a living writing if you have tenure and if you have a patron, if you have some other person or institution in your life that's taking care of your bills, then you can go off and do the art thing. But if you but don't have class, that, you, we found out now you could write a book, and if youngest child puts it on TikTok, right. you can have a bestseller. I could. I totally. But you could. still won't make any money at it. <laughs> no, no. Well, you know, as long as I can get into that that uh, bulwark book review loop, you know, book talk, yeah. book reviews, yeah. Um, yeah. And maybe, you know, maybe one day I will disappear and start writing children's stories. I don't know. Uh-huh. But um, it, it really, and I'm not saying this is like, we're super people. We're super, we're just concerned citizens who have a particular ability, a special skill set, um, writing and talking and thinking on our feet and, and remembering things. But it does require a certain amount of daily discipline to get up and do this. Right. And after a while, if, if you're hoping to make rent doing this, and we're not talking about getting rich, we're talking about keeping a roof over your head and you find out after five, six, seven years that it's impossible. Right. That not only is it impossible, but the people who are doing well, just ignore you. Yeah. Just don't yeah. want anything to do with you because they have their own little club now and you, you're you not a part of that anymore. Um, it's easy to say, well, f- screw this. This is, you know, I'll go off and do something else. I'll vote. I'll stay or current. I have I'll to correspond. go off and do something else. I can't. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, your ability to, to go without sleep uh, during those years. And I mean, it was like three or four years where you were, yeah. Up until one in the morning mm-hmm. writing and then getting to work by seven. Yep. Yep. And you were divorced and had no kids and had two cats and that was it. As far as your responsibilities were concerned, you had a big mortgage. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you didn't have uh, a lot of other people depending on you to make oatmeal in the morning. Oh, you know, I, I that... did learn I did learn an invaluable skill. And I still have it because I'm a big guy. I'm six, eight. I'm a big guy. I'm I'm. Mm-hmm. I'm and at the time, I had a long ponytail, long ponytail, wore a suit, was very conspicuous. And there were certain social obligations involving going to a bar after work sometimes that one at certain level, you're kind of obliged to do. And I liked most of my coworkers. And so we'd go out every now and then for a drink. But, you know, about 45 minutes later, they'd be looking around going, where do you go? <laughs> where do you go? And I was gone. I, I had a drink and I, we socialized. I had a lovely time, but I had to get home. And do the blogging thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I did. So I, I learned the gentle art of disappearing without anyone noticing, <laughs> um, which is a tricky thing to do in a crowded bar when you're a big guy. When you're like six me. foot eight. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but I managed it. But, you know, that's our story so far. And we're still doing it. So there's still, you know, virtue in doing it. But it, it blogging around 2007 and eight changed in a really substantial and kind of depressing way. Mm -hmm. And we'll go into that in the next episode. We're going to talk about that next time. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, we're always looking for more Patreons to make this podcast fly. So if you can afford to support us in that way, please do so at patreon.com slash proleftpod. And thank you so much for that. See you next time. See you next time. The Professional F Podcast No Fair Remembering Stuff Tuesday edition is produced under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2022-23, DGBG Productions.